This residential estate is in the heart of the Surrey commuter belt. It's typical of the success, wealth and show of the modern age. And in the middle of it is this tower, which is typical of the success, wealth and show of the Tudor period. But it's also the tip of an archaeological iceberg, because if you look at this really old drawing, you can see that the tower is the gateway to a lavish palace which was once owned by some of the wealthiest men in the country, the bishops of Winchester. It's a palace that was once so admired that King Henry VIII literally stole one of the buildings. So how much of it survives under these beautifully manicured lawns? And how many of these gardens would it have once covered? The palace has been lost for over 300 years. We've got just three days to find it. Well, this plan of 1606 shows the gatehouse as it survives, and then it looks like a socking great castle. And what's this over here? Well, I don't know what that is. It might yeah. be a chapel, but it looks three storeys and a stair turret could be guest lodgings. That's all to play for, that one. Jonathan thinks that this early plan might just illustrate the late medieval layout of the palace in Wainfleet's time. It certainly shows Penny's tower with a courtyard surrounded by loads of buildings. Great targets for our geophys in Penny's back garden. Mm. It's so frustrating. On day one, we just have to wait until they've geophys. Well, no, no, I, I've got a trench get for digging, you. Get digging, get <laughs> digging. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, let's do that, if you don't mind. Please do. Could, if, if you could be my guest. give us permission. <laughs> this is a zonking great building, isn't it? Isn't it? Now, what's a bishop doing building a great tower in, during the Wars of the Roses. Hang on, do you actually live in this? Yes. How, so how many rooms have you got? <laughs> Five bedrooms. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's a nice house. It's, yeah, it's a very yeah. pleasant, comfortable place. But was it always comfortable? That's my question. You've got a hole for a musket at the top, and then maybe arrows underneath. I mean, is this a bishop who's afraid for some reason? So if you've got arrow slits around the corner, and the 1606 map shows a big wall. So this would be? Coming off of yeah, this angle, yeah? yeah? Pretty much down there. What's that wall doing there? It could be a thick wall with a parapet, like a curtain wall of a castle. You've got doorways coming out of this wall here in this direction anyway, so there must have been a range of buildings across here. Yeah, so I think we should put a trench somewhere across this range here, and then we're likely to pick up not only the curtain wall, but the, the walls of this range as well. Yes. Now think about this, because I think they're implying that they trash not only your back garden, but your front garden as well. That's fine by me. Go for it. Get digging. Go for it. Get digging. <laughs> We're Music off. to our ears. <laughs> so we're going to dig our first trench in Penny's front garden to see whether Wainfleet built a large defensive wall around his palace. Penny wants trenches, so no messing around. And digging starts straight away. William Wainfleet was one of the most powerful men in the 15th century. As Bishop of Winchester and Lord Chancellor, he owned 240 properties. But our search for his Esher Palace won't be easy. The Bishops of Winchester lived here from the 12th century, and they, and any of its other owners, who include Henry VIII, Cardinal Wolsey, and Francis Drake's family, could have built on the site. Although Wainfleet's tower still survives, the rest of the palace was knocked down at the end of the 17th century, and the area's been landscaped on several occasions. All these phases complicate our search, but they're not the immediate problem for Phil. Look, we've got a main sewer coming here through where those bricks are to that manhole, and then at the same time, we've got the, the canopy of the trees. We can't dig anywhere underneath there. None of this is possible. We really can't be digging any further than that down to the canopy over there, which is where your buildings are going to be. But we can survey the whole area. We can survey right up to the trees, so we can hopefully give you a plan. Tree roots might be a problem, but not all our clues are below ground. Since we want to discover more about the palace Wainfleet built, what better place to start than the tower itself? What is it that's so innovative about this building? Well, in the 15th century, we'd been at war with France. Now, we'd had a lot of experience of our generals going over to northern France and Flanders and seeing brick buildings. But it's exactly at this period, with that influence from the continent, that people like Wainfleet start building with, simply with bricks. There's one here. Example, Farnham is just up the road. Yeah. And he's got exactly the same approach to building completely with brick. Is all of this building Wainfleet? 
Well, it's a jigsaw puzzle, Tony, because we've got 300 years of occupation here. Later improvements often have little bits of classical detail that these architects are so used to, they can't imagine doing without. That's a, a Greek key motif, and that is um, called the Vitruvian scroll. It's a wave motif. Penny's really keen that Wayne Fleet should be recognised as this really innovative architect. Mm. How do we work out which bits were him and which bits were tacked on by someone later? I suppose brick sizes are useful, aren't they? We can, we can have a look and see whether those bits with the diaper that are obviously Wayne Fleet's are the same size as, as some of these finicky bits. In the front garden, where we're trying to find out if there was a defensive wall, Jonathan and Matt have hit on archaeology. Fine mortar. And that's what he was 18th century. Might well be 18th century, actually. Yeah, I'd be looking for bigger chunks of chalk knocked together with some little dark flecks. Yeah. So my guess would be you're talking about 18th century demolition. Yeah. We haven't found the wall yet, but Stuart's had a look at the early plan, and he's convinced it holds the key to Waynefleet's palace. This map, which is produced by Ralph Treswell, is a spectacularly informative map. Yes, and I've seen a blow-up of just that tiny space. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it includes a phenomenal amount of detail in the buildings, and it's actually a measured survey. Although the buildings are drawn as if they're a bird's eye view, the way this is made was to make a plan and then draw the buildings on afterwards. It must be one of the very first measured maps, then. It is. I think there, there are a lot of clues on this map. I mean, this is a real gem to work with. So this early plan is a great starting point to search for Wainfleet's palace. It shows Penny's Tower as the gateway to the complex, with a possible defensive wall coming off the side. The mysterious chapel lies to the south. There's a keep in the next door garden, and a large building, possibly a great hall, immediately in front of the gatehouse. So Phil and the diggers begin to open a trench in the back garden in order to test John's geophys and tie down the buildings. Oh, look, at the, ah, no, it's got the mortar, it's got the mortar, look, it's got the mortar on it. But that's the edge of it, there's the... So that's one corner of it, now there's the rest of it. No, so. After a day and a half in Penny's front garden, Matt might finally have made a breakthrough in the wall trench. Hold it there for a second, Ian. Think. There we go. Oh, without a doubt. Ah, and there's a course down there as well. Uh, that's the other side there. Brilliant. Definitely. So we've got one bit there and one part of the wall there. So what am I standing on here? Matt seems to have hit a brick wall in more ways than one. While in the neighbouring garden, things are just getting started, as Kerry opens a trench to search for the chapelly structure. And in Penny's back garden, Rakshar's opened another trench based on John's geophys results, which showed a large building, possibly a great hall. Now, Phil's cleaned up the walls in his trench, he's pretty sure he's found part of it. If this is the Great Hall coming along like this, geophysics says that it doesn't run the other side of the path. Right. <clears throat> so, if this is the corner of the hall, I'd like to resolve whether or not it turns this way. Yeah. If, it, if it's absent from there, yeah. we know that the hall has got to be this way and yeah. not that way. Yeah, yeah, or in yeah. other words, whether we got the front corner or a back corner. Yeah. Good. Very good. Keen to solve this puzzle, Phil and Jonathan want to know whether Rakshar's trench holds any clues. Raksha. Oh, hello. Hey. How are you doing on? Doing very well, actually. We've got this, this wall running down here, and it's still it's composed of the similar material that Phil has in his trench. We have something coming up this side, which is composed of flint and mortar. Not, I can't really see what's going on, because I think we need to extend that way. Mm. And then we have this floor running through here, and I'm wondering whether it's a corridor or not. Is there any chance that you're walking on a floor that's made up of bits of rubble and cement or mortar that would have had tile on the top of it? Oh, one, two, <laughs> two uh, three, three, four, four five, six, six seven, seven, eight, eight nine, ten. About ten metres. Well, that's foot. got 30 foot, isn't it? It's just over 30 foot. So that's, that's exactly right for a great hall. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Me, yeah. I like Bang that. on, typical. Nice. So we found the Great Hall, which ties in perfectly with our plan, and it must have been part of Waynefleet's palace. The hall's made of stone, so it would have been built earlier than the brick gatehouse. 
We've also located a wall in the front garden. It's made of brick, but is it Wainfleet? Hey, Jonathan, come and look at this lot. Mate, I can have a nose. Yeah, come in there. This is all getting very, very complicated now, look. You've got two walls going on. We've got the first wall here. Yeah. It's lovely flat face down to there, and from there downwards is the slightly more messy foundation. And also appears there's been a drain cut through it there. We carried on back, there's rubble. So either the wall has collapsed down here, like that, or it could be the beginning of a culvert which came up like that. And then we hit another wall, or in fact it's more of a large plinth, with a kind of triangular feature on top which seems to have a couple of bricks heading off in that direction. That 1912 map didn't show two walls here, did it? Not at all, it showed one wall marked coming straight up this way. Quite a wide wall, but... And this is that wall, do you think, that's shown in 1912? It seems to be on the right alignment, a little bit off. So does that mean there's a passageway between these two walls, then? Well, there doesn't seem to be any floor in between, in between these two right. walls. They're also not quite aligned together, yeah. so they could be different phases as well. Beginning of day three here in Penny's back garden in Isha, where we were looking for Isha Palace, except now we think that at least some of the time it had a much more defensive function, maybe something more like Isha Castle. And this being day three, some of our lads have been here since seven o'clock this morning because they think that in these trees somewhere there might be a really important, significant trench. Actually, it's more like a badger in here, I think. They reckon, thank you, that there could be the keep in there. Although yesterday, you said that the majority of the keep was in the next garden. So why is this so important? Yeah, that's right. The majority of the keep is in the next garden. It's just possible that this strip down here might be within Penny's garden, but the majority is in the other garden. There's no doubt about it. Look. That's the survey next door. You can see the keep quite clearly. This dotted line is the avenue of trees behind us, and the keep extends across here. So you haven't been able to geofiz behind the trees? No, but it, it extends round like that. So could these red bits actually be the tip of the keep? Yeah, and we're digging in here. It's looking good. Yeah. We've made loads of progress. There's a great hall opposite Penny's gatehouse, We've found a wall, though we're not sure how it fits into Wainfleet's grand scheme, and now we've got the chance to discover and date a whole castle keep. The site's now a hive of activity. Bridge is busily digging in our chapelly trench, and the diggers continue their early morning efforts on the keep trench. I'm keen to see how the great hall fits together in Penny's back garden, so Jonathan's giving me a guided tour. Rakshar is on the other side, yeah. picking up on the geophysics. It was very clear. And there is another piece of ironstone masonry. That's the other side of the hall. So what's the logic of that? Why is it here like this? Well, you see, nothing should impede the relationship of the gatehouse to the hall, because you need to be guided through to the entrance to the whole complex. OK, so I come through the gatehouse. Yeah, and the hall is the assembly space. So yeah. come with me. You're now walking through the porch, and you've gone through Raksha's wall. You're into the hall now. There's the kitchens over there. They're knocking up dinner for you. This is where you as a bishop, Bishop Tony, yeah. um, have a court, you have retainers, you have staff. This is your, basically, your staff canteen and big reception space. It's an all-in-one, multifunctional extravaganza. So I come in here? Yeah. yeah, so through the timber screen, and Aubrey describes a roof here with angels holding up shields. Fabulous vision and bits of stained glass. So from the south, the stained glass will shine through on a platform at the far end where the bishop sits presiding over everyone. Now, when he's finished his meal, he's going to go up his stairs, off he goes, there's bishop, warmth, bed, comfort, far end, there's the kitchen's noise, dirt, smell, danger. The hall separates everything out into, into servant's end and posh. Well, that's that bit sorted out. Let's go on to the <laughs> next one. So not only have we identified the Great Hall, but thanks to documents, we've got an idea what it looked like inside. Helen's keen to find out what else the documents can tell us. John, now we've got that dendro date, 1462 to 1472, for the building of the gatehouse. Is there anything in the pipe rolls that would help us narrow down that date even further? There was a word I couldn't read, and uh, I've read it now. What I've translated it? it. It's Zabili. That means sable. And you think, well, that's yeah. a fur, you know, for a gown or decorating a hood. But in fact, I discovered from the Wolsey building accounts that he had sables and they were ropes and they were special ropes for gins, that's the engines, and cranes, the heavy duty lifting equipment uh, of late medieval, early modern building sites. So 
so there's some major building project going on. In 1462 to 3, and obviously a rope had snapped, and so they had to yeah, replace so, it. So it occurs in those repair accounts. So is that enough of a smoking gun? To it's, make very, us it's highly suggestive. Highly suggestive. That's fantastic. We've now got the evidence which proves Waynefleet commissioned major works around 1462. We know he built the gatehouse opposite a medieval great hall, and I'm spurred on to find out whether that wall and the keep were part of his grand design. So, we reckon that if this is the keep, the key identification thing is whether or not this wall carries straight on or whether it splays out into the turret. Fabulous. And I reckon that we are just about a point to know whether or not that's true or not. Fantastic. Because <laughs> you see, look, we've got a wall coming along there. <coughs> and it's going straight there. Oh, look. Oh! <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> That's just brilliant! So what would have been in that turret? Another staircase, or...? I don't know, what have you got? What have you got in your, <laughs> what have you got in your turrets? <laughs> you had worked with him as long as we have, you'd know this was just a mere fluke. <laughs> I'll just ignore that. You get on in with your toys. <laughs> Things are also shaping up nicely in the wall trench. Have you sorted this yet, you chaps? It's been a breakthrough, Mick. Oh, I like breakthroughs, <laughs> that's good. We have got, can you see down here, see the brick floor here, which joins up this wall and this wall. Ah. Uh, so they were definitely contemporary. Right. So does that help us, Jonathan, in explaining what it is? It does. If you're, if you're standing in what's a passageway, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. And this is a pier there, so that a column of, of brickwork rose from it. Right. This ties in exactly with what John Aubrey shows in his 1670s survey right. of this being a whole arcaded wall with a terrace on top. Well, that all makes a lot more sense now. Doesn't it? it? So we'd walk out there onto the top level of a big yeah. arched wall, yeah. maybe with crenellations on the top, and it does feel like something of a castle defense, yeah. doesn't yeah, it? Yes, yeah. That's brilliant, that is. You know, you imagine coming through the big brick gatehouse into yes. a courtyard, and no sooner have you got past that that's impressive, you get into a courtyard out here, and there in front of you is an even bigger brick tower. Well, when you come through the gatehouse that he's built, he has a two-storey wall with a terrace on the top. He's got, he's got his own private link between the gatehouse and his lodgings, because that's what this is all about. It's smart lodgings in a place that looks like a defensible yeah. castle. What's the relationship of this keep with the Great Hall? Does he live in both of them, or does he live in one of them? I think it depends on whether he's visiting here as a stopping-off route yeah. you know, yeah. on his way to London, or whether he's having visitors here, because if he needs to entertain, then he's going to be in the hall and retreat to the lodging. If he's on his own, he may as well just walk through the gatehouse and lock the, himself in his room. The hall's a big display place, isn't it? Where, you know, you have feasting, you, you show off how wealthy you are, how much food you've got and so on. He's not going to do that if he's just going to come in for a, you know, a pint and a sandwich on the way <laughs> on the journey. <laughs> well, it's the perfect end to our three days in Isha. A major brick-built palace that had been lost for 300 years. He wanted Wayne Fleet's reputation restored. Seems like he's kind of done it himself, doesn't it? Got this massive gatehouse, put a defensive wall, a curtain wall, all the way around it. Lots of buildings here for food preparation, kitchen, great hall dominating the middle of this area. And right over there, even bigger than the gatehouse, a keep and virtually all of the buildings in your garden. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. In 1534, Henry VIII visited this manor house in Buckinghamshire, the first of many visits by the King and his daughter Elizabeth. But the owner knew that the royals expected only the biggest and the best, so he had his home transformed into a palace.
But magnificent though this Tudor building is, it's hardly big enough to support the king and his entourage of over 300 courtiers. It must have been at least twice this big. So where's the rest of it? And what exactly does it take to build a house fit for a king? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. A historical document mentions a wing measuring nine chambers from the church to a gatehouse. This could either run along the north or the east of the courtyard, with either one containing the grand gatehouse entrance. Jonathan's preferred option is two wings with the gatehouse to the east, giving us a palace large enough for a king and his entourage. We're talking about a house that Henry VIII visited and Elizabeth, up to a thousand people descending on it for periods up to a couple of weeks or, or more. It must have been a very big complex with lots of supporting structures. Mm. So my neat vision might be much more complex in reality. Mick, how do we explode Jonathan's cosy vision of what this place would have looked like? Well, I think we can look the two wings that are on there that, are, that don't exist today. We can have a look at those by putting some trenches across and see if there is any walls in the bottom of them. But of course, the building itself is a piece of archaeology and it's full just by looking around the outside of, of, of clues of where walls have joined on, windows have been altered. So there's a sort of three-dimensional jigsaw to sort out of the building itself. Absolutely isn't there? there is, yeah. <laughs> I want to know what the difference is going to be between this painting and what we finally come up yeah. with. Let's get on that. And so our first trench goes in based on Jonathan's recreation. Here on the proposed eastern wing, close to where he believes there was a grand gatehouse. You're a bit previous, aren't you? We haven't even got the GFS results yet. Yeah, but I, I don't think it'll matter, actually. We've got a lot of clues as to what might be going on here. We know about these two wings. We can see where that step is there by the, by the fire yeah. alarm. There's different sorts of brickwork there, aren't there? There's all sorts of stuff going on. We're going to have to spend a lot of time looking at that. Cause it, it, for now, it just tells us something's coming off in this direction. As well as rediscovering this structure and the rest of the palace, we hope to find out why much of this complex disappeared over the centuries. Because historical records show it was large and grand enough to play host to Henry three times and Elizabeth twice, a place where they and their entourage could rest, feast and hunt. The house's high status was due to one man, the first Earl of Bedford, John Russell, who had a meteoric rise through the Tudor court. He was in the service of a man called Sir Richard Jerningham, who was one of Wolsey's key officials. Now, what's important about that is that when Jerningham died, um, Sir John Russell not only, if you like, stepped into Jerningham's job, he also stepped into his bed, he married his widow. <laughs> that was and Anne that, Sapcott, Sapcott, who inherited Cheney's. And that's how he got Cheney's. But that coincided with Henry VIII taking Russell into the Privy Chamber. He was a gentleman of the Privy Chamber in 1526. Now, he was one of only eight people in the country who were allowed to touch the king, and even one of those eight, the barber, was only allowed to touch him when the king specifically invited him to do so. So Russell is one of those very key courtiers at the very heart of the Tudor court. So really, you could say that Russell was one of the eight most important men in the country at that time. Absolutely. Now, but what Henry also does is um, he gives him a wedding present, and he gives him the manor of Amersham next door. And that gives him the money to build a chainers. Oh, crikey, yeah, look that? at that. It looks like we've got... See, that is a mortar surface there. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the yeah. holes in the yeah. ground that will confirm floor, or sink Jonathan's the theory. You must be inside a building. Hang it's, on, why do you say that that's a floor? It's, it's, a, it's a laid mortar surface. It's very compact. It's evenly distributed. It's laid on these bits of these brick surface. It may have had a tiled floor actually on the top yeah. of it, yeah. which they lifted off, but that was, what you're looking at is actual foundation surface for a, a, a floor, I think. And they've got but something else over there, haven't they? Now, this is really the good stuff. Look, we've got this, these mortar bricks in here, but look, it's bang on line That's with the end of the wing. Lines up exactly where we want it. it to be. Why yeah. couldn't that be 21st century? It could be. I mean, there's still a lot of demolition rubble about it, but that, that looks to me, that looks to me Tudorish. I mean, one, one, pe one piece yeah. of pot yeah, does not right. make a, a period. Yeah. But it, I would have thought we could be looking at, at that sort of period. It's almost like that Cistercian weir, isn't it? Which is that sort of very dark green stuff, you know. Yeah, I think it's all right. There's our first bit of Tudor. Got it good? Early days yet, Tony? Yeah. The evidence does suggest this wall is Tudor 
which going by Jonathan's theory means we should be close to the sort of grand gatehouse you'd expect at the entrance to a royal residence. But just as one piece of pot doesn't make a period, one wall doesn't make a wing. So we're putting in another trench to find the other side of our possible gatehouse wing. Trench 2 has also come up with the goods, and it's even more substantial than the wall in Phil's trench. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, that's wallish, isn't it's it? It's very wallish. <laughs> it's got the wall up here, and we've even got some flint footings, which, you know... Fairly typical, aren't they? Local resources, chalk and flint. Absolutely. Good, good yep. for the Chilterns, yeah. Not only does this feature line up with the existing Tudor wall by the church, yep. there's even some traces of plaster on it, suggesting this could be the inside of our northern wing. Here's our Tudor wall, and that does line up exactly yeah. on the end of the building. We still don't really know whether we are in a building, or, as this material here, this gravel material, might suggest that we're actually into a courtyard surface. The other problem, of course, is that we've got these walls here and we don't know, again, whether they're a building or whether they're garden features. The trouble is that they've been so smashed around that we've got no idea where the floor levels were. We've got the Tudor wall there coming off. Now, what we don't know is whether it's a building, a structure, or whether it's just a boundary wall. If we go back a little bit, what we're starting to see is a wall running for a flush, so it's more like a boundary wall. If we go back even further, it shows even clearer this strong wall all the way running across the front. It does suggest that that wall is no more than a boundary wall rather than a structure. Yeah, you can't really see any structure. It's, it's, it's still a bit confusing. It is, isn't it? I mean, I'd like a painting from the other side. That's what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got one of those. No, not at all. <laughs> We just don't have any evidence here to back up Jonathan's original theory for a gatehouse. Although the wall may once have been part of a larger wooden structure, for example a gallery leading to the church. But it does mean our straightforward plan for this site is unravelling in front of our eyes. Hopefully this trench behind the garden wall will find the other side of the northern wing. But just to confuse matters, geophys have discovered these anomalies in the courtyard, suggesting two completely different shapes and sizes of that northern wing. And that means we'll need to dig two more trenches to test their results. And if that's not complicated enough, we seem to have lost the east wing entirely. The archaeology and archives now suggesting it was just a boundary wall. In the midst of all this contradiction and confusion, Stuart has been fertling around the site in his own inimitable fashion. And he now believes these massive earthworks to the north of the site could be the remains of the formal Tudor gardens. It's got mortar in it, hasn't it? Yeah, are, there any, are there any bricks in it anywhere? There is a little bit further up. We've got brickwork. Slowly but surely, Stuart's evolving his own very different theory as to the whereabouts of the Grand Palace. Plus, the records show it was also at the very heart of a royal scandal. Henry was showing off Catherine Hurt. She was his trophy wife. <laughs> he wanted everybody to see her. I mean, the irony is, of course, that a week later she is denounced for adultery. Mm. And, in fact, there is also evidence in the National Archives that while at Cheney's, you know, she was engaged in a liaison with Thomas Culpepper. Oh, really? Actually and here? Absolutely, absolutely here, yes. Yes, because the, 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 the evidence against her actually mentions Cheney's. If you're approaching from that direction, you're going to approach from the back end of the church. Yeah. That's going to be the first thing you see, the rear of it. Yeah. And why would you want to approach from the back of the church? It seems just to turn its back on everything. You want to celebrate this building. Um, it's halfway through day two, and we've got almost nothing to show for it. But that suddenly changes when we get the dendro dates for the west and south wings. This bit here comes much later, in the summer of 1550. Oh. Hang on, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, when did Henry VIII come and stay here? 1540, well, 34 and 41. 41. And we've been assuming... This isn't Henry VIII's reign, this is not part of Henry VIII's reign in that case. <laughs> we've been yeah. assuming that this is the constant, this is the reason that we came here, because yeah. we'd got a bit of the place where Henry VIII stayed. That's so nice. the, bu the building is elsewhere? Yeah, the buildings that uh, Henry saw or elsewhere. Or elsewhere. Mm. Although he did see this one behind me. So this wing on which we've based so much of our digging strategy wasn't even built until after Henry VIII's death. And that means we can turn this dig on its head, distilling a new layout for the house. And this is it. With the main entrance to the west, 
and a grand set of lodgings to the north overlooking terraced gardens, which is where our new trench will go in. Unfortunately, it's in the most inappropriate spot on the whole site, jammed in between a wall and our portable toilets. Ah, oh, the glamour of archaeology. I mean, look, you've got um, Queen Elizabeth come and stays here for a, a month in 1570 and, and visits it repeatedly. She loves the old rambling house. We've got details about her secretary saying, it's not in a decent state for her to come and stay. You know, we've still got a Tudor monarch staying here. It's just a different Tudor monarch. Yes, if you could loosen this lot up, that would be a lot easier. Over at the portable toilets, it seems that the doubting Thomases were right. Ah. Within inches of the concrete surface, Phil's uncovered some tantalising remains. So what do you reckon then, Jonathan? Is it uh, Tudor? Well, what I can say is this, that all, all the characteristics are there for it to be generically Tudor. I mean, it's in, inevitably difficult... What do you mean, generically well, <laughs> Tudor? Because each site has its own brick-firing clamps and, you know, reuses material. It's set in soft lime mortar in the right way, the bricks are roughly the right size, and they seem to be making an English bond, which is um, the pattern of having the ends of the bricks all in a row, the sides all in a row, alternate, and they get fed up with that by about the middle of the 17th century, so it's good. It looks like we may be finally in the right place. And surprisingly, it does tie in with our new plan for the site. What we've got here is the wall of a narrow range of buildings which led from the chapel at one end with the hall and the big house at that end. Why do you say a narrow range? Well, it's like, it's like a corridor because this being one side of it, we're on the outside, that's on the inside, and where that wall is there... This one here? Yeah, that's on top of what we think might be a Tudor wall underneath. We can't prove, that's speculation, but we haven't found any evidence of any buildings over there. If I uh, draw it on, on here for you. Hang on, where are we? We're, we're stood about here at the moment. Yeah. What we seem to have is a, is a, a wall that came off the end of there to close a, a courtyard. And here we have a corridor, a narrow corridor range coming down here to join the chapel there. Yeah. That would link into where the hall was, there. And then coming off from there would be this big fine building that we've been looking for. This is the bit that connects the big smart house with the chapel at this end. It might not be as glamorous as we'd expected, but this narrow range is the one that features in the 1585 inventory, running from the church to the grand building Phil's digging. Replacing Jonathan's original theory of a quadrangle building for this new layout. A layout that now seems to be confirmed by Phil's trench where this wonderful bay window has been unearthed. So we've got a group of bay windows on that north side looking down onto the gardens. Which is all the terraced area. Yeah. Right. Uh, we also think we've now found the main entrance to the complex, which includes some of this standing building. Jonathan's thinking seems to be that we've got the gatehouse is actually not a building with a with a tunnel under it and arches, which is what my initial thought That's what was. I've been thinking of yeah. for three days. More likely, a couple of buildings either side of a passageway, mm. yeah. which would have been cobbled, of which that's one, and the other one probably ought to be somewhere here. But the only way we can be sure we've got the right dimensions is to dig and geofizz this whole farmyard. So, bish bosh here and bish bosh over there? I, I would have thought so, yeah. There's a lot to do with just a day to go. Our new plan may be causing headaches for the archaeologists, but it's completely transformed our understanding of the archives. This is a cracking piece of archaeology, isn't it? Thank you, mate. It really is. <laughs> do we understand it now? I think we actually do. I think what you're looking at here is the front facade of the Royal Lodges. We think it's actually built in probably two phases. They put up one skin of bricks and then added. But f the most obvious thing are these two bay windows, one there... One there and one over there which they've actually added on to the front of the building. So it's got a whole series of glass windows up the front of it. It really shows how important this is. And we check this out, it could have been a garter robe. Turns out that, in fact, it is just a massive bay window. Yeah, yeah. we've had glass out of here as well. Oh, so nice. Right. Anyway, right. once we come into the building, yeah. we've got a room on that side yeah. and a room on that side. So a partition wall down the middle. Well, it's, it's more than a partition. Look at the size of it. It's quite as big as, as big as the outer wall, isn't it? <laughs> And you see here, look, you see we've got a whole series of these little niches cut into that wall. Now, I reckon that's where the flooring joists would have been. So oh, if you allow yeah. for the flooring joists yeah. and allow for the floorboards on the top, mm. I reckon 
that floor level is about here and you would have looked out down yeah. over yeah. the valley. So it would work out to be about 30 foot in depth and I yeah. mean, you could say it is literally palatial. We may not have found a Tudor ensuite bathroom, but these remains show the sheer scale of the apartments that would have greeted the royal entourage. This new layout has got one final treat in store for us. After careful measurement and cross-referencing with the 1585 inventory, it seems we may have stumbled across the bedchamber of a certain Henry VIII. By 1541, when Henry came here, he had a badly ulcerated leg and he wasn't as mobile. Uh, and in fact, um, he would have stayed in this building on the ground floor, not the first floor, as you know, a monarch would normally have done. Was it? Well, we think that because when Henry VIII's bed was actually given away by the second Earl of Bedford in, in 1585, it was actually on the lower floor, in the lower chamber. Now, the royal bed was absolutely huge. You didn't just bring it into the room. It was probably built inside the room and wouldn't go out through the door. It's bizarre, isn't it, that we're in this old bus, and yet at some time in history, King Henry VIII might have been just here, gazing out into the garden with his separated leg. Well, I think that's entirely possible. And this would have been just one small part of the fair lodgings that Sir John Russell had built for his royal visitors. Because wedged between the dining bus and the portable toilets, geophys have been able to confirm Stuart's suggested extent of the missing Tudor range. As you get up to the line, there's a definite response where the uh, front wall is. <laughs> We've got a clear demarcation there. Right. And that lines up perfectly. Oh, excellent. That's with Phil's the walls excavation Phil's walls, trench yeah. going yeah. through there. Possible back wall at that point there ah, running yeah. through. Just this side <laughs> of the bus. Under the concrete. So if we hadn't <laughs> have parked the dining bus there, we might have been able to have a look at it. And yet all that now remains of this grand palace is a beautiful fraction of its former glory. This is the story of a grand medieval house turned into a palace fit for a king. Its facade further embellished with modish and very impressive bay windows by the time of Queen Elizabeth's month-long stay in 1570. And dendrodating shows that by this time they'd also added another wing to the south of the complex. In every respect, this house reflects the very pinnacle of the power and wealth of the Earls of Bedford, its Tudor owners. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. In the incident room, Carenza and Sarah are having a look at the written history of Poppleton and there isn't that much to go on. The Doomsday Book, the Doomsday Book tells us quite a bit more. Um, you know, we've got the ex extract here, and it tells us in another, that is Nether Poppleton, Odie the Deacon had two and a half caricuts taxable. That's two and a half caricuts of land. It's about 300 acres. This land was of St Everilda's, that's the church. So what date does Poppleton first appear in the written record? Well, the first reference is in 972, when Oswald, the Archbishop of York, listed a large number of lands in Yorkshire that he said the church had lost during the wars earlier in the century. And among that list, he included just two hides, that's about 240 acres, in Poppleton. Um, and that's all the record tells us. What about the place name itself? That must predate 972. Well, the place name has Saxon elements in it. Ton meaning a settlement and popple meaning the pebbly place, so the settlement on the pebbly soil, the settlement on the pebbly, uh, perhaps, banks of the river. Um, so it has a Saxon element and that could indeed be, in a sense, in one sense, the oldest reference that we have to there being something here. Last night you could have cut the tension in here with a knife. Paul and Carenza and I were getting really frazzled because we wanted to get everything ready for everyone to be able to dig this morning. Well, this one was like Pollyanna. Oh, don't worry, <laughs> everything's going to be all right. 
Well, was he right? Have we got everything sorted out? Yeah, he was, because we got really frazzled and worked really hard at it. And then we've been hard at it this morning, getting all the data presented on a map that looks respectable and that we can show the villagers. Did you actually find anything that surprised you? Yeah, we did, actually. We've got no Saxon pottery at all from this end of the village. And it's not until we start heading west through the village that we get a few fragments of Saxon pottery, tiny triangle here showing just a few grams of pottery, tiny little amount there, a bit more here as we head west, and then even further west in this completely a different bit of the village what looks like a different history okay good morning everybody <laughs> thank you very much for coming back i'm going to tell you the results of the test pits yesterday which you all dug and thank you ever so much again today people from the village have turned up to help they're all keen to know where the oldest parts of the village might be so today we'll explore that area in more detail the villagers jobs now done we do the work from this point on. So the test pit at number 20 is widened to become a full trench. But today, we'll concentrate more on the area around the church. It's Norman, but dedicated to a nun who lived in the Saxon period. So we're hopeful of finding Saxon material there. So up by the church, we open a test pit here. here, and another here. And John does some more geophysics in and around the church to see if we can find other targets. Mick's getting more and more excited. It's not just Saxon he wants, he thinks that there was a monastery here. That would mean a settlement 400 years earlier than the present church. Could he be right? Meg, you've closed down this trench. Yeah, well, it's told us all we needed to know, that, which is that the church doesn't go on further east. But that means we've still got this 400-year-old gap between the time the nun died here and the time they put up this church in memory of it. Yes, but I think looking at it as a gap is probably wrong. I mean, we're, we're pretty sure of what would have happened during that period. Well, what do you think happened? Well, what tends to happen is when you get somebody who, who's turned into a saint, you, you often have a monastic community with it, and that is unlikely to have survived more than a couple of hundred years because the, the Scandinavians coming through here... Well, the old Vikings. Yeah, the Vikings. And they burn everything down, they destroy everything. If there's ever a nun in here, it just evaporates. The only things you tend to get left is perhaps the church site. If there's enough locals around and they survive and they carry on being Christian, it gets turned into a parish church or, in some cases, it gets turned into a proper medieval priory, but we don't seem to have that here. Stuart's survey of the earthworks around the church has thrown up some interesting results. Here's the church. There's a medieval moated site just here. But there's also a whole other system of earthworks. This seems to be a roadway from the river heading straight towards the church. There also seems to be a large platform at the top of it. And off to the side is a large lump in the ground, another platform. In one of the test pits closer to the church, we've also hit the bottom. And we've got an interesting find here. What's nice here is we can see two distinct phases of archaeology. We've got the later wall, which looks to be 18th century handmade bricks running down the garden, and they're overlying straight on top of this earlier cobbled surface, which contains 15th century and therefore probably dates to that point too. So what can the pottery we found tell us? I've laid some of the finds from the test pits out, sort of in chronological order, uh, give you an idea of what's going on. We've got the Romans down there all on their own. Um, then a great big gap here. This, this is, is the black hole of 400 years? Yeah, this is the, the early and middle Saxon, say 450 to 850 AD. There's nothing so far. And then we arrive at the late Saxon. Now, when we're saying late Saxon, I suppose what we really mean is Viking age, 850 through into the 10th century. Then we've got this stuff, which is all the Norman period stuff, 11th to 12th century. So those people who were saying that this is a, a medieval settlement, we've, we've proved that that's wrong. We've got a lot of Norman Oh, stuff. yeah, we've got Norman and we've got pre-Norman, so... I think from the pottery we've got here, there's very little doubt that there's, uh, there was a settlement here in the Norman times. The pottery we found proves that there were people living in and around Nether Poppleton right through the medieval period and right back to the 11th century. That part of the village occupied by houses was laid out in the medieval period. 
but there was already a Norman community living here. So we closed down all the test pits in the village. They've answered that question. The big question though, was there an earlier settlement still stands? Our only chance now of finding anything earlier lies in what we find close to the church. That monastery that Mick's besotted with is our only hope of pushing this village history back any further. We also look at other things in a different light. It turns out that this column we found yesterday also has Tudor bricks in it, so it could have been part of the foundations of the Tudor house. And in this garden, just behind where the wall was found, there are lots of little lumps and bumps that, with our new view of what might be happening, could be leftover walls. So our architectural historian is helping us to plot them out. So we should map them so we can see how they relate to the earthworks. Yeah, if you, if you look up towards the north there, can you see there's that slope in the ground? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a drop-off down there, yeah. And then it runs straight towards us, okay. where we're stood, in fact, and then it returns at that point. There's, there's a corner just there, that way, doesn't it? That's right. Once we put the information on a map, okay. it may show us the outline of the Tudor building. So just walk straight to you. Yeah. I'll walk up to the next corner. OK, I've got that. OK. Oh, I've got that. So if I plot that up on the computer, see how it relates to the earthworks and everything else. And while the hunt for the Tudor building continues, we're also looking for evidence of a monastic settlement around the church. We still want to find it. Stuart thinks he has an idea of where it could have been. See down below us where, where the trench is? Yeah. That's cut across a line of a ditch which goes straight up there and leads straight towards the churchyard. So it's, it's going beyond the churchyard wall down there? Well, I would suspect so. You can't see any trace no, of it in the churchyard. No, no. But it actually comes along from there, down below us, yeah. heads towards that, that pylon there in the yeah. distance. But it does a right angle across the field it, there. You see where that greener, greener grass is across it's there? It's just a bit, bit beyond that. There's actually right. quite a dip when you get down there. Right. And then on the aerial photograph and in the earthworks, you can actually see a ditch heading down towards the river. See where the low ground is down there? Yeah. Well, that's where there's a series of fish ponds now, probably to do with the, the manor house. See the bottom of the slope in front of us? It is, is but yeah. what that dip is and why they've used it as fish ponds is because it's, it's an old river channel coming through there. Ah, right. So that yeah. might be the yeah. sort of former edge of the river yeah, yeah, in, in, yeah. in the Saxon period. So I think what this, this monastic enclosure is doing is it's coming along here, doing a right angle, heading, heading down, down to the, the river. river. Yeah. Um, potentially where it is over that side, it, obviously the church is there, which you'd expect You'd to expect be that to be in it, wouldn't you? It. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, it looks as if you know, the, the other edge of it is going to be where the village is separated from So from where here. the big hedge is, where the big trees is, is where it's getting back towards the river That's again. That's right. I mean, it's, it's almost like the field that we're in, yeah. apart from a small bit at that far yeah. end, is, the, you know, is yeah. the monastic enclosure. You know, it gives you that, you know, that, that sense of isolation that I know you like with monasteries. Well, that's right, yeah. It's almost on a promontory sticking eastwards, isn't it? It is. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely ideal. This is the area described by Stuart. It's the edge of the monastic enclosure, with the church inside it, and the edge of the village forming one side to it. It's a huge site, but entirely what one might expect. Mick's happy with it. Back on the ground, Phil has removed the legs, they were from a dog, and he's got some more good news for Mick. Phil, that is not a one by one test pit. No, oh, it's a two by two test pit actually. It started out as a one by one. <laughs> exactly. Though, so why did you extend it? <laughs> because of what we found in here. I mean, look, we've got this, this, this feature, what looks like possibly a shallow pit. And it's not merely the fact that we've got a pit down there, it's what we got out of it. Is that Saxon? Yeah, it's this 450 to 850 Middle Saxon stuff. So does that mean that this feature, whatever it is, is Saxon? It, it could be. You've got to be a little bit careful because we've also had early medieval pottery from there as well. But the thing that we have not had 
is late pottery or any post-medieval yeah. pottery. So, in other words, I'm fairly convinced that that feature has got to be early medieval yeah. at the latest. Mick, have we any idea what that is? Well, I don't think we have at this stage, and this is one reason for extending the trench, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. But it exactly. is the sort of thing you expect on these these sort of Saxon sites. You know, they've, they've put timbers in the floor or, or posts or something like that. And look how close to the church we are. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're right in the area you would expect activity at that time. So what are you going to do with this now? Well, just take it on down, try and find out what this feature is to enlarge the trench. We've got a lot to do today, haven't we? We have, yeah, but, you know, this, this is coming on. We might even have a go at this one later on as well. It's got the same sort of thing in the bottom of it. The hunt for the Tudor house is going well. Kerry is cleaning up the main part of the wall. Some locals are helping expose more of it, while we're beginning to think that the material in this trench is to the front of the house. And Henry is now pulling together the bigger picture from the lumps and bumps he plotted. So, what would it have looked like? Well, judging by the fragments that we've uh, turned up so far, we would have had a range at the back which would have contained the hall, some ranges coming off either side, uh, which might have uh, contained uh, chambers and such like, uh, an entrance into that courtyard, and then an outer courtyard where all the service buildings would have been, and including perhaps this building, the barn. So we are looking at a complex of buildings. Oh yes, quite an extensive site, yes. Everyone's saying we didn't even know there was a Tudor building there before, is that right? Well, bizarrely, yes it is. The only references we have are sort of rumours, if you like, in Victorian histories. You see here, there's a reference here to the manor house. Now that's the current manor house that's still standing. And it says here that that was built out of the remains of the ancient seat of the Huttons, the old house. That's the reference to an older house that was used to build the existing one. But we had no, nothing more definite than that about it before now. As we uncover more of the walls, we begin to get a clearer picture of this Tudor house. The evidence points to it being very big. The front wall runs from here to here. The earthworks in the orchard suggest that it extended right back to here and the thickness of the walls suggest that it was a couple of storeys high. It was a prestigious place. Stuart took me on a tour of the front of it. If I'm a visitor to the Tudor house, why am I coming up this way rather than from the road? Well, this is where the privileged visitors would arrive, the, the high status visitors. You wouldn't want to come in past all, all the peasants, basically. So what can I see over here? You'd see ornamental ponds, little waterscape just out there you can walk around. And over there? In this enclosure here, you'd have trees, ornamental orchard type trees, and they'd be screening what was the old moat. By the time you got to this point here, what you'd see in front of you is this grand facade of this new Tudor house. So presumably that's the whole point of the grand walk-up. It is, it's, it's, show, it's showing off, it's showing off to you as a visitor. This is, this is its display side over here. And if you look out from the house, well, what you've got looking this way is an open landscape. It's a hell of a view, isn't it? It, it is. It's private and it's privileged. You can't see the village, you can't see the peasants. You've got, you've got ponds, river, open landscape, orchards, ornamental gardens. Very show-off, very Tudor. And this is what this enormous complex would have looked like. This was an impressive building dominating the landscape, with its own entrance to the church, and to the river. Out in Phil's trench, he's now reached the bottom of this feature. The Saxon pottery he found came from the other side of the trench. But what does this side tell us? So what do you reckon? What have we got out of this now? <laughs> well, not quite what we expected, Mick. Right. You remember on the geophysics, there was that, that white line, which Very we clear, thought was, was, was going to yeah. be a beam slot, a yeah. building, that sort yeah. of thing. Well, there's no way that this is a building. This is a massive ditch. It's going to come out, what, at least that size? Well, I was going to say, because you've only got one half, haven't you? The other half going to be That's over right. here somewhere. And have you got any dating for that ditch? Yep, we've had pottery from about the Norman Conquest, right through to about the 14th century. It's, it's within those sort of three or 400 yeah, years. Yeah. And, and I think that what we're looking at is activity here in the early medieval period at the same period as that church starts to be built. So what do you think we have got here? I think it's probably something to do with 
well, the Norman period, you know, the, the church is all of that sort of date and later. Yeah. We'd expect some sort of manor house to go with it, probably somewhere in this area, if not down on the, the moated mound. And this is one of the land divisions associated with that. The main thing is, I think, that we've actually got people living round here, yeah. which, of course, you don't have now. Up on the top of the hill here. If you look at it now, yeah. there's just one house here. Yeah. There's no, no village at all. Yeah. In those days, this would have been thriving. But what of Mick's missing monastery here at the east end of the village around the church? Do we have any evidence for that? Well, we do. Why they've used it as fish ponds is because it's, it's an old river channel coming through there. The Saxon ditch we found is most likely in this instance to have been from a monastic settlement. The church seems to have been built on the site of a former church or monastery. Its dedication to a saint who died 400 years earlier is an important clue. And the topography on a promontory is similar to that of many other monastic sites. So now we just have to explain all of this to the people of Poppleton. What can we tell them after three days of exploring? Mick, can I borrow you a minute? Yeah. So we've got Anglo-Saxon here, Anglo-Saxon here. Yeah, we must have some sort of hamlet here. Well, so. to begin with, they were right. Their village is older than it looks. This pottery shows us that there was occupation here in Norman times and in Saxon times. In the Saxon period, there was an enormous enclosure surrounding a monastic settlement. It would have had a church as the centerpiece, houses, and a few workshops. The promontory it's situated on is perfect. Easy access to York and a bit of height to give it some security. In Norman times, the present church was built and a settlement grew up around it. And then, three or four hundred years later, an enormous Tudor mansion dominates this part of the landscape. This is something no one had expected to find. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.